So I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on today, the Wajuk Noongar people. I pay respect to their continuing culture and to the contribution that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people make to the life of this city and to all of Western Australia. I also offer my respects to elders past and present, particularly those who are here with us today. So a big welcome to the State Library. My name is Rita Alfred Sagar and I work in the Heritage and Engagement team. I'm delighted to be introducing this event today. It shows that the library, it continues to recognize the subject of our discussion this evening as an important one. Last year, I had the privilege of collecting a podcast series on the subject of death and dying, which is now part of the State Library collection. I interviewed some amazing people and heard experiences that were both powerful and uplifting in their emotional honesty and because they connect us all. Tonight's panel discussion, I'm sure, will again allow us an opportunity to speak about matters of life and death. And that's the tagline for National Palliative Care Week, which takes place this week. And I've been speaking to so the members of the panel who have been particularly busy because uh, they, they've been reaching out to people during National Palliative Care Week. We're immensely excited to partner with two research institutes from the University of Western Australia to hold this conversation here tonight. I only really have one important job that I have to do tonight, and that is to point you to the exits at either side of the room in case of an emergency, and to let you know that the toilets are outside in the theater foyer. Everything else I'm going to leave to our facilitator this evening who is Professor Shamit Sagar, the director of the Public Policy Institute at UWA. And I'll let him introduce you to our panel. Please welcome him. Kaya Wanju. Hello and welcome. Uh, it's uh, a real privilege to welcome you here this evening to the State Library um, for a, a three-way collaboration between the State Library, the Permanent Institute, and my own Public Policy Institute, uh, looking at matters of life and death right now in the middle of Palliative Care Week. Um, before I go any further, as is our custom at UWA, I'd just like to also share our acknowledgement that the land upon which the uh, Crawley campus is located is uh, in pre-colonial times and today the traditional land of the Noongar people. We naturally pay respects, our respect to their leaders past, present and future. And it's also a personal point of pride to me that in pre-colonial times, it was a place of learning and continues to be so. Um, as Rita mentioned, I'm Shamit Sagar. I'm a professor at the university. And when I'm not doing that, I'm the director of the Public Policy Institute. To quickly share with you for a moment what that is, um, the Public Policy Institute, easily misunderstood, um, is in fact part and parcel of a pattern, a, a trend in fact, that you see right across uh, research intensive universities all over the world, uh, who are increasingly sensitive, and in my view rightly so, uh, to the need to make sure that their world-class research is shared with decision makers both in government, um, in business, in nonprofits, and campaign groups. Um, it's very tempting for us to carry on producing research with elegant footnotes and detailed models which we share with ourselves. And through the work of the Policy Institute, uh, we're trying to make sure that that needle is shifted in the direction of ordinary users, but particularly decision makers who want to participate um, in a greater level of evidence-based public policy. That's why we exist, and you can sort of check out our website to see the range of things that we, we are involved in. Um, like I said, it's a three-way um, collaboration. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with others, and this is a, an especially um, important collaboration of ours. Uh, but to get that um, moving, let me just sort of say one or two words by way of scene setting, by, by way of introduction. And, and the thoughts are threefold. Um, the first actually comes from, and if it doesn't mind me sort of borrowing from this, um, uh, Samar's own, um, Professor Samar own, owns own uh, opinion piece in yesterday's uh, West Australian. Uh, and if you don't mind me just quoting for a second a couple of things that you said that I thought were quite striking. 
which he points out, and it's an interesting way of putting it, which is that um, only 5% of the time of someone who is dying is spent with health, health professional. And yet 95% of that time is spent with their family, their friends, their communities, all the way down to their pets. And yet there's something about that where we've somehow underestimated the capabilities of that latter group, their family, their support. And perversely, we often end up overestimating what can be achieved by the medical professionals without in any way criticizing the medical community. Think of that, five versus 95%. They're very striking figures. They're not even remotely close. And what we expect of one and what we should expect and what we can expect, um, I think is part and parcel of the sort of the, um, the, uh, the rationale for this year's, uh, this afternoon's event. The second reason I think why this is important is that uh, the work um, that Samar and others have been taking forward does strike me at least as being a really good example of ideas that cut through. Uh, it's relatively easy to state the problems of death and dying and all the multiple things that are going wrong that cause and contribute to a picture in which so many people either die alone or die in suboptimal circumstances. It's much more difficult, believe me, to present something as a solution to that. So here's an idea that she has clearly had at some stage and she's developed into something more than an idea to try and cut through the, um, the myriad of obstacles that lie in our way. And the last thing I think is that at the heart of, and we'll hear more about this this evening incidentally, is this very simple proposition but it's very powerful in the context of death and dying, which is that um, the more we can connect people and support people at grassroots level, uh, the more that they can then develop and grow flourishing networks of their own, um, the more that is correlated with better outcomes for them and their families, and ultimately the less suffering that they will be. It's a very simple proposition if you follow it through, but it requires investing in people, not necessarily one at a time, but in small groups at a time, and doing it through the bottom upwards. But the, the dividends, the payoffs, as it were, um, the reduction in suffering and harm is really quite substantial when you start looking at this model in practice. But anyhow, we have the great pleasure and the great privilege, sorry, of um, uh, sharing, uh, having a, a Samar and others share with us that model in practice. It's not just analysis, but it's also a response to that, that, that problem. And to shed light on all of this, um, we're going to be um, this evening uh, talking to uh, three people on our panel, so let me now introduce them if I can. Um, we have Professor Samar Oon, who is uh, at the Perona Institute, and she holds a research chair in palliative care at UWA at the same time. Uh, secondly, and she's on the far right, if you don't know her, in the, um, in the striking yellow. Um, secondly, we have closest to me Dr. Fiona Findlay, who's the medical director at the Silver Chain Community Specialist Palliative Care Service down this end, and in the middle, in the multicolored top, we have Rosalind Scalaro, who has personal, uh, is a personal care and has personal um, experience uh, and is a community member of some of these problems right up close in the recent past. Before we get into that in detail, we'll, they're the people we'll be sort of hearing from in the first instance, uh, can I just ask um, uh, if Samar can come along and just introduce a short film that uh, has been presented, prepared, sorry, um, by way of a stimulus in terms of the kind of issues that we'll be looking at shortly. Samar. Thank you, Shamit, and thank you for the State Library and Perron Institute and PPI for um, you know, hosting this event. Thank you for coming, and also those people on live stream. So it's about compassionate communities. You may have heard me say something about it before, but as Shamit said, uh, we really need to look at practical solutions to um, how we do our end of life. We need to basically think about different ways that are going to make people die in a way and in a place that's really um, fitting with their values and their choices. And do they know their values and their choices? That's the conversations that we need to have really early on uh, so that we're not leaving it till the last week when we are too emotional 
uh, things are too bad and then um, we're not having the right conversations at the right time. So with people, um, this program is called the Compassionate Communities Connectors Program. We trialed it in the southwest of Western Australia with, uh, in partnership with the WA Country Health Services. It's about showing how the community can work with health services and they are an integral part of delivering good quality of care, good quality of life, and then good quality of death. Um, the way it works is that we called on volunteers from the community if they'd like to support families who are um, during that stage of life-limiting illness. Uh, with a little bit of training, I must say, they all came with a really good background of death literacy because they had the lived experience. They've supported other people in their communities and their families. And, um, and they were um, given those families to uh, support with the practical and so social support that these people needed. Um, and all the time in partnership with the health service. So this, um, um, this short film really show you compassionate communities in action. How did these wonderful compassionate connectors um, reach out to, the, to those families, held their hands, made them less scared of death and dying, and they had somebody to talk to. So I'll leave, I mean, we can have the discussion after the movie, but just to give you an idea what's happened with that program, which we're hoping to roll out everywhere eventually. And the health service had actually taken up this program as business as usual, so it now carries on as their own uh, way of doing things, which is fantastic. And this is like a, what we call a, a good translation and a rapid translation into practice. And, you know, we hope we talk more about policy a bit later on. So thank you. I think the community needs to be there to support. Death's not a secret, but sadly we often treat it as a secret. I'm a New Zealand born Māori and I met my husband Malcolm uh, at Teachers Training College in New Zealand in 1970 and we married in 1972. I guess that the, I, I can describe Malcolm as he didn't have any enemies and there, were, there wasn't anyone that didn't like him. He was strong, he was frightened about dying. I met Gus in 1980 at the Blacktown Workers Club, mid-year, um, and five days later we moved in together. So we've been together nearly 41 years. We married in 88, and by that time we had six children. So we we're a blended family. Um, Gus had two children, I had two children, we had two children. Gus was very, very fit. He was, um, he'd gone back to uni as a mature age, around about 60 years old, I think he went back. He loved books, writers, authors, always had. Um, he always thought he had a book in him, they say everyone has, and he did have. And then he became ill. And we never thought it would last. For the first few days, the doctors were saying he's got a, a very big growth on his lung and um, he would not be surviving probably days. You know, it wasn't going to be long. And so, because he didn't want to die, he wasn't ready, um, we, we asked really that, that we go somewhere that we can, you know, help to the doctors were worried that we were trying to prolong Malk's life uh, because we didn't want him to leave, but that wasn't the case at all. We didn't want him to leave until he was ready to leave, until he was ready to die. So, um, in there I looked at the Compassionate Program um, and asked to join and be part of it. To have Gus suddenly, very, very suddenly unwell, um, it just threw us in a tailspin. I think everyone knows they could get sick, sick at some point, but you never think it's going to be you. And, um, and we never thought it'd be permanent. I think we are. You know, we still have kids sitting in desks. I came into contact with this connection, this program. Uh, there was something left after a meeting in hospital, and I looked at it and wondered about it, and 
um, had put our names down, talked to it about it with Mal. I had the privilege of coming in and um, meeting with Mary and Malcolm. I could see they both had needs. Um, both were so loving towards each other and were so worried about the other person they weren't discussing their individual needs. My role was to come in and I guess get that conversation going. Um, both incredibly capable people and um, I saw myself as being an advocate just to slow them down and say what do you need? Yes you're capable of doing that, you can do that, you're intelligent people and you're in control of this situation. Well, it's wonderful meeting Jenny. Um, and we got on straight away and she's the type of person that you can talk safely with, if that makes sense, that um, you can sit down and you can have a conversation and talk about things that you can't talk about to other people, about how this has impacted on your life and be honest. You don't always get the opportunity with family or friends to be honest. I do a lot of listening with Jenny and um, with Gus I was able to get a retired principal to go in and spend time with him. Gus is a very academic man and he likes an um, intellectual conversation. Um, so it's sort of finding people that kind of meet that need. Yeah. On end of life care, upskilling the community is a really key point um, that, that we are working towards at, in the Compassion Communities Network. There's nothing worse when, you know, um, somebody dies and then the family is lost. What do they want? We've never had that conversation. And I think this is where uh, we need, we, the community needs to focus on and I think we will get a much better advanced care planning than, say, a clinician doing this in a, you know, in a hospital or a clinic um, because we're talking about a life. No one wants to feel helpless and um, it took me a little while to realise that this wasn't so much about helping, it was about supporting and being beside people during, um, during times when they otherwise couldn't cope on their own and that was me. I was just overwhelmed. I would have completely, I believe, fallen over if I hadn't had the Compassionate Programme um, and being involved with Jenny and the Compassionate Programme. Nobody wants to die, but if people are allowed to speak about their fears around death, I think it makes that process more bearable for them and those that love them. nicely put together film and very sensitive to some of the quite um, tricky issues that are involved and so uh, we're going to have a discussion in the first half of um, this evening uh, and then later on we'll sort of bring the audience in I'm sure people want to come in so we'll have some roving mics that are going around um, there are a lot of people involved in this with great expertise but I think that it might be useful in the first instance to hear from one of our panelists um, Rosalind Scalaro um, Rosalind just to give you a little bit of context, I mean, she's, um, she's from Bunbury and she was the main carer for her uh, mother who was living with a uh, cancer diagnosis for a very significant period of time for seven years. Um, there's a lot of things I can say about her and we've, we've talked previously in terms of her background, but um, I think the, the, the problems that you and your family were facing at that time were probably made significantly worse by the complications of COVID certainly came along. Um, on top of which, um, there's this sort of really important point, I suppose, which is that um, although the palliative care and the, the sort of you know, um, the compassionate communities program, the model itself that samar has been pioneering, came too late for you, um, nevertheless, um, you yourself, of course, have volunteered to now become a trainer. Uh, so there's a kind of lovely part of that story that, that, that is useful to know as well. I'm going to get out of the way. You probably know much more about Samara, uh, sorry, about Rosalind than you need to know at this stage. Rosalind, I just want you to sort of share with us your experience of what you went through and how you reflect upon it today. 
Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you, Shemit, and uh, thank you for um, allowing us to share our story. On May 13, 2022, we lost our beautiful mum to CNS lymphoma, which is a form of cancer of the brain. Mum fought bravely for seven years, and in that seven years, I had the privilege of being with her every single day. But sadly, due to COVID, which impacted many families, our time with her was limited. And as a family, a lot of the time we felt isolated and helpless. The mum was very frightened and confused. In March last year, we received the news from mum's oncologist at Fiona Stanley that it was time for us to prepare mum for end of life care, as we only had a few weeks left to be with her, as the cancer had occurred for the third time. He showed care and compassion. He was a wonderful man. He was mum's oncologist for seven years and he cared for her the whole time. He said, take her home, close to home, where she can be loved and cared for by her loved ones. We took her to a small country hospital um, to be cared for, but sadly, we probably didn't get really what we wanted. Mum lived longer than her prognosis of two to four weeks and managed to hang in there for 10 weeks. And on that, and after those two weeks in palliative care, she was no longer treated as end of life. Um, and she was moved to a long-term aging patient, the long-term aging patients. And because of this, our privilege to be with her in her dying days changed. And because of COVID, and now because she wasn't supposedly end of life, um, our visiting with her was even more restricted. There was five children, 13 grandchildren, and five grand great-grandchildren. But there was only my dad and myself that were able to be with the mum through this time. So it was very long days for dad and I, morning and night. Um, and mum was seeing the rest of the family through the window and she was very confused as to why she couldn't speak with them. Um, and we weren't even allowed to have the window open because of COVID. So it, it was very, very difficult. Long. We didn't have any support um, at that time um, or advice of what was ahead for us. It was probably the loneliest and saddest that I've ever been. We were not aware of this wonderful com compassionate community network that Samar has brought to the South West. And being able to have had a connect to help us through this time, I know would have helped us as a family immensely. Many times we asked, mum, was that, mum asked, we asked if we could take her home for a short period. Um, and because of COVID, we were told that she couldn't come and go. And also we didn't know what help was at, actually out there. It was also suggested that we shifted mum to an aged care facility, which we couldn't believe um, um, and we didn't know why. In her final weeks, my brothers and others were permitted to see mum. Um, there were some very caring staff who understood our plight, but um, some were unforgiving as to why our desire to see mum as a family, what our desire was to see mum as a family unit. We understood that they had a job to do. We also understood that it was COVID, but to me, compassion and empathy should not change for end of life care. In her last weeks, we begged if we could now be with mum as a family and dad to spend his last nights together. They were 61 years married. We were told we could have one night. Um, Dad could have one night with her and we could only have half an hour with her. I'm glad I picked the right night because mum passed the next morning. She was waiting for us all to be together. But a half an hour really isn't long enough to share memories to grieve and heal a little. Again, we couldn't understand why the short time with her when we were in the room. The following morning, Dad called us and he said, it's close and it's time to come. So we all got together, ran to the hospital, but again, we weren't permitted to go in because we were only have, allowed to have two at a time. So I stayed at mum and dad's house. I picked two roses for her um, that I wanted to give to her and I waited, but I didn't get my turn. Mum left us while we waited. My brothers were in the car park. I was in the car, her siblings in the corridor. It really was an unforgiving experience. For seven years, we shared this journey, but sadly in her last breath, we could not be there. The irony though, was that when mum did pass, we were allowed to stay in there for quite a few hours. So as a family, we have struggled through this year as to how mum's end of life journey could have been different. I came across this wonderful community network a couple of months ago, and I know this would have made a complete different scenario for her and for us. There's such a need for this program so that other families don't go through the same fate. In time, I will become a connector to help other families because when you are at life's journey, those who mould you, you should be with the people who moulded your earthly journey and lead with compassion and respect. Mum was a woman of faith, of love for her family and of humbleness, and we were unable to fulfil her wishes, but she knew how loved she was and how we tried. We need to get this message out there, that there is help, that you can have end of life at home, and we do need to get it right. Might have, mum had a difficult end with her cancer, but the confusion was compounded by the way we were made to feel and probably lack of advice and support. It was an opportunity for her to be in nurturing, loving surroundings with her family. 
so that she, she could receive the love that she'd give all of us in her 79 years in, on, on earth. Closing the chapter of one's life cannot be rushed or made small. It's worthy of patience, generosity and love. Thank you. Um, is that on? It is, yeah. Thank you, Rosalind. Um, so we've got two other panellists, um, Smar and, and um, Fiona. Um, I've got pages and pages of their biographies. I'm not going to read that out. But what may be useful is just to take the top lines. So Samara is the Peron Research Institute, Peron Institute Research Chair in Palliative Care, UWA. And Fiona Finley is the Medical Director of Silver Chain Community Specialist Palliative Care. Both of them have the word palliative in their job title. They're publicly facing job titles. So the question I want to ask them, naturally, can you explain to us what that means, the word palliative? Palliative care is whole person, whole family, whole community care to me. Um, so it involves looking after people with a life-limiting illness um, and allowing them to add life to their days, not days to their life, if that kind of makes sense. And those are words stolen from people far wiser than I. Um, so, um, so I spend my working life um, caring for patients in their own home in the Perth metro area. And listening to the story just brought back nightmares of, you know, hours spent on couch trying to get exceptions for families from interstate to visit during COVID or families to be together. Um, and I think the journey that we all went through through COVID um, and the, the requirements um, to get in and out of the state in particular were very challenging or to get in and out of even a hospice. Um, in Metro Perth um, were very challenging. So um, it's heartbreaking to hear the other side of what those denial letters that I got from writers sitting on my couch writing caused. Um, so, yeah, but so palliative care is, is whole person care and whole family care. Smile. Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, got a <coughs> palliative care specialist here. And um, it's nice that we all work together in this field. So palliative care is about a holistic care. It's about the psychosocial, spiritual, existential, family care support, bereavement support. It's all that in the definition, not just symptom management or clinical care. And you know, as Shamit mentioned, only 5% you know, of the time spent with people, uh, people dying is in that sort of clinical sphere where they need a health professional. 95% is with us. Are we skilled? To do this, are we skilled to apply this palliative approach to care? We could be. We already have a lot of lived experience, but it's just a matter of, as a community, really thinking that we could be part of that care. We can deliver that care with a little bit of help, training, confidence. We can go back to the old days, you know, where we were born at home and we died at home. So, you know, that's how it used to be. Now, because we've got fantastic health professionals, um, that's great, and, and we should have that, but the community has been de-skilled. They think they can't do it anymore. And they are, we are with those people all the time. You know, on the weekend, you know, there are no formal services when people feel really anxious and they start admitting themselves to hospital because they have no, no, nobody to, to help them care. But with the compassionate connectors and the caring helpers in the community, they could call them, they can come to them, they can, you know, appease them, you know, talk to them. And then there's no need to go to the hospital if there is no need to. Um, so, so that's been, you know, how uh, for me palliative care is much bigger than what people think it is. It's about living your life to the full. And the film that Palliative Care Australia have produced, Live the Life You Please, that's exactly it. It's, it's getting you to keep living and enjoying life and normalizing things until the end, you know, comes. And this is when we call it end of life care then. But unfortunately, uh, sometimes the boundaries are blurred. A lot of people think, you know, when palliative care team starts helping, oh, they're going to die tomorrow. That's not the situation. We really need to be, uh, you know, to explain more, I guess, as being in the palliative care field, that um, it's, it's about quality of life. It's not about, you know, you're going to die the following day. So uh, unfortunately, the, the misconception is still there. And I don't know what we do about it to actually <laughs> make it more understandable. 
I routinely get asked by doctors not to introduce myself as a palliative care specialist because that's too frightening for the patient. Can you yes. say a bit more? Why, why, what's the patient going to be frightened of? I guess we live in a death-denying society, um, you know, and palliative equals death. I mean, you know, I've been told that I don't look old enough, sad enough, or black enough in terms of clothing to be a palliative care consultant. Um, so I am routinely asked to introduce myself as a pain, as a cancer pain specialist or a symptom control expert. And in fact, we've renamed some of our palliative care clinics and hospitals symptom assessment clinics instead of palliative care. So if, if doctors can't say death, dying, life-limiting terminal, how do we expect our patients, their families, their communities, their loved ones um, to have open and honest conversations? That sounds deeply confusing if you think about it, yeah? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, listen, I want to come back to you. I mean, you have first-hand experience. You described some of that to the audience a moment ago. Um, I mean, I think the, the obvious question I want to ask you is, which is, you know, what kind of additional support, now you look back on it, would you have liked to have seen? And also, would you have known, or how do you ask for these things? You know, how, how, who do you ask? How do you go about asking for these things? And that's exactly right. We didn't know who to ask or where to mm. ask. Um, we sat there hours and we actually, oh, I'll be honest, we didn't see anybody. And it was really, really hard. My dad's 88 and he sat alone six, seven hours a day. And um, I was the same and we didn't, on a, uh, we didn't know what to do. When mum um, was early diagnosed, we did have two palliative care nurses who came to us um, at home. But once we were in the hospital, we didn't see anyone as far as the support um, as a family and, and how to deal with it. Um, we, we, didn't, we didn't get that. And it was really, really hard, very difficult. And we would have loved to have asked, we, there wasn't even a pamphlet or anything in our little hospital, so. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And um, just this particular bit that came, I mentioned earlier on, which is that, um, uh, well, why do you want to now train to be a, a connector? because I know how hard it was for us. And as a family, we are still struggling. It was mum's anniversary last week. And last night, each of my brothers rang me to wish me luck for today, because it was a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. But my mum would have wanted me to do this because that's the sort of person she was. And you don't want to have to sit there alone, hours on end. You, you want to be with those that care for you and love for you. And because I know it was COVID and it was really hard, but I just feel end of life palliative. And like you said, you need to be surrounded. Mum needed us and she didn't have us. And that was probably the hardest thing for us. So to me, to be able to get out there, because when I spoke to Samar, I said to Samar, so could mum have been at home? And because mum was quite debilitated, could she have been at home? We lived on a farm surrounded by everybody. And she said, yes. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, wow, we didn't know. Okay, well, we'll come back to that, okay, your, your experience of that. Um, Samara, I've got a question for you, which is um, this, you know, death in Australia, dying in Australia, sometimes characterised as being sort of very atomised, very isolated. And, and you spent a lot of time looking at this field. You were saying it was, ne it was never necessarily that once upon a time. And also when you sp spread out and look across different cultures, both here and as well as overseas, you tend to get very different philosophies, different approaches to the whole business of dying and what it means. Do you want to expand on that a little bit for us? Thank you. Um, I'm always asked about what got me in this field. And to be honest, as a researcher, I've never really dwelt on it because I want to tell you about the research outcomes, what a good programs they are and how we can do it. But, um, you know, I've come, I come originally from Lebanon. So I've been here for 30 years or even more. And uh, when my dad died, that I got a call. I got a call to come quickly because um, we don't wait to bury our dead. So <clears throat> I was rushing to go to <clears throat> my workplace, my old workplace, and uh, to chair a research meeting. So I called to say, sorry, look, I'm going to be a bit late to book my ticket. The following day was Australia Day, so I really needed to get on quickly. I go in to the research meeting afterwards, and nobody said anything to me. And they were health professionals. And I'm saying, I'm sure, you know, they didn't mean anything, but they didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. They didn't, they couldn't face my pain, so they just ignored it and kept going. Um, no, that's not okay. 
The following day I was on the plane and you know, so I went to Lebanon and my experience was absolutely surreal. Um, I didn't know what to expect, but the whole community looked after the funeral. We had three days of mourning. We had people come from morning till evening. We laughed together, we ate together, we, we, we cried together. And in three days, I felt my acute grief has resolved. Like, you know, I was like, uh, just the, the love, the dignity and the respect that we all had and able to express this within the community and being surrounded by all this love um, really was very healing for me. And this is when I think coming back on the plane with 24 hours on the plane, I had a lot to ponder on. And I'm thinking, that's it. Death, dying, grief and loss belongs to the community. It cannot be professionalized. It cannot be medicalized. And as our uh, esteemed colleague who started the, this whole concept of compassionate communities, Professor Alan Callagher, um, he said death is a social event with a medical component. It is not a medical event with a social component. Yet in the Western world, it's become too medicalized, and I'm sure Fiona agrees with that, too professionalized, and, um, and the community needs to be, to take its stand. It needs to be more health literate, you know, about the health system, uh, and to be death literate about all the dying matters and how to prepare for it, and grief literate. How do you support each other when somebody is also grieving this? Um, and that's my call, really, throughout this, from this research that's come, we can do it. We've done it in the past. Everybody was there for us, you know, for our parents or our grandparents. So let's get back into what really matters and, um, you know, just act in a compassionate way, communicate in a compassionate way, and uh, that, that would bind us all together again. Thank you. Um, and um, and how, how long ago, I'm going to characterize this as being sort of a golden age when things weren't like that. When could, when, how far do you have to go back to Australian society to describe a more socialized, less atomized picture? I don't know, probably I wasn't here. Okay, I'm just curious yeah. about whether people have researched that, looked at that. You know? No, ever since I, I've, we've come like 30 years, it's been for me like this. Okay. And I guess I'm coming from a different culture when I used to be like, you don't get invited to a wake, but just you go after the funeral. I just felt, when do people grieve? Because there, there, there was no exhibition of, uh, um, of sadness. And I guess this is something in the Western culture. Uh, you can't, you know, sadness, pain, all that stuff. We need to uh, avoid at all costs. Um, yeah. Mm. Sure, you wanna? And I think mm. that's interesting because palliative, palliative medicine is a speciality in its own right. Is sure. it about 50 years old? Um, so we have to go back more than that time because the, the rationale for the evolution um, of palliative medicine as a specialty was to call out the over-medicalization of death. Um, so we need to go back at least that far um, where, you know, doctors were in charge um, and hospitals were where people died. Um, so before that, probably 70 plus years ago would be my guess. Okay. All right, it's useful to know that. Fiona, can I just ask you a question on this? Now, let's go to Silver Chain as, as a provider. That's sort of your kind of day job. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it does in its sort of palliative care offer um, in the spectrum of other providers as well? Where do you sit? I guess, so the brief spiel is Silver Chain Specialist Palliative Care looks after at any one time around about 700 people in their own home. We're a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary team of registered nurses, doctors of various levels um, who operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we can get a, a trained nurse to a home at 3 a.m. on a Sunday from Waruna to Two Rocks. Um, we provide equipment. We do all of those sorts of things. Unfortunately, we don't meet all of the need out there. And I think that, um, you know, we have to limit our service to those relatively close to the end of life or those with significant symptom burden. And there are many groups we do not meet all the needs for. So there are other services. There are many outpatient palliative care services, but they are essentially medical services. Um, and there are inpatient palliative care units. And I'm not gonna remember them all, but you know, Kalamunda, Murdoch, Bethesda, um, who provide inpatient palliative care for either a symptom control stay and then discharge home or end of life care. 
But the story you, I hear from you around, well, after two weeks, people thought, well, it wasn't end of life care anymore, rings so true because we're all stuck in funding models and care and resource limitations and trying to fight to get the, the best possible care um, as we see it. But predominantly, I look after patients at home. I've done five home visits today of, of people, you know, in their last months of life. Um, to assist with care planning, but I'm the 5%, not the 95%, you know, and I'm probably the pointy end of the 5%, so I'm probably the 1%. Um, so that, but certainly, I mean, I tell my med students when I take them out with me, I know more about your patient on their doorstep than you do after two weeks in hospital. And I think that that's incredibly true. Yeah. Okay. What's the, what's the reaction when you say that to them? They look shocked. They looked even more shocked when I, you know, walk into someone's house and, you know, pull up a dining room chair or kneel on the floor or sit on the floor or or act like a visitor, not a doctor. Sit on the end of someone's bed, be a human. Um, so I think it's a really powerful thing to do to take med students, junior doctors, nursing students, um, but not everyone gets that experience. Okay. Um, do you want to come in? I have not. No, okay. Um, Rosalind, I've got a question for you. Um, in that film that we saw earlier on, um, I think there was an exchange between uh, Jenny and Gus, if I got the right pair there, and something was said along the lines of um, uh, you need to be able to um, validate um, that people are capable. You know, People are capable, potentially, in theory, of a lot of the support that being described, being advocated from the panel. But they need some validation. They need some permission. They need some get-go. It doesn't necessarily spontaneously happen. Um, so, Rosalind, in your case, I'm just interested in knowing um, you, th these skills, these, these possibilities of looking after and, and making the end of life so much better sit within you. Um, is this something that you require a palliative care sort of specialist to sort of show you the way? Or is it something that you feel that people, once they're possibly, you know, well-trained, can sort of put their mind to? I think, um, I think when you've lived the experience, as we lived for a long time with Mum, um, I think we know the heart part of it. We definitely will need um, the medical part of it. Um, but I think a lot of it is just being there, sitting there, holding their hand. You know, we know when it's medical time. But I personally feel now that... Um, if I went to someone's home, I would know what to do. Um, I'd know how to help that family because um, I know how much we needed it and I just know how important it really is. And at the end of the day, it's not hard to hold someone's head to care and see what actually people need. And end of life, that's really all you need. I know that's what Mum wanted um, and she didn't get that. She just, you know, we were waiting outside and, and that's not what it's about. Um, Mum had seven fantastic years of medical care, cannot fault that at all. At the end, she needed us, she needed family, she needed friends. Um, but we definitely had also seven years of silver chain, which was fantastic. But at the end, we needed more. Um, that was it, yeah. Good. People need people around them. And that social connectedness is at the heart of what we need to claim back, and the community need to claim back. With the trial that we had, we had 43 families um, taking part. Half of them were home alone. Not that they didn't have any one. They were disconnected from their families. And they were socially isolated. And if it wasn't for the connectors who were able to enhance the social networks around them, and bring people from the community to help them because they didn't have their own naturally occurring networks, you know, like friends, family, they didn't have that. Otherwise, they didn't need us. Um, so people in the community just said, yeah, you know, roll their sleeves, said, yeah, we can help those families. We can mow the lawn. We can um, take them to their medical appointments. But you know what they needed the most? Social support. They wanted somebody to come and have a cuppa with them and have a chat. They're not able to see people face to face and have a chat to that. And how difficult is it for us to do this? Like, it is difficult, obviously, because I mean, otherwise they won't be in such need. But I think that's what we need to um, bear in mind, that social isolation is going to be the biggest killer for our 
aging population and then we are going you know as well going that way if we don't really start thinking in a more social connected way um, obviously we're so super connected to the whole world but very disconnected locally you know people don't visit each other I mean there are some families one lady said uh, told the connector please don't park outside my car because I don't want the neighbors to know that there's something wrong with me but you have a terminal illness. It's not a sin. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a crime. It's. It's nice to know that people are visiting you and caring about you. So, we really need to teach you know the community to ask for help again, uh, because if they don't do this, they are de-skilling the whole community. Um, you know, and and that way they're benefiting. The community is benefiting. Uh, so that social connectedness, reducing social isolation, that's what we are most needed. That's why it is in everyone's means, you know. Um, the connectors have done a great job at doing it. Um, Rosalind, I'm sure when you when you get to that stage, you're going to be amazing connector uh, because you've had that lived experience, you know what's needed. Um, so it's, it's not just about, you know, holding hands with them. Um, and, and there are different kinds of volunteering, the traditional hospice way. Uh, it's quite different to what the connectors have been doing. The difference is that it's quite a distinct form of volunteering because they have more agency, they have more autonomy, how they actually help the families. They don't need to come back to the health service and ask, could I do this, could I do that? They become friends. It's about building the capacity of the community to help each other. It's not just them helping that family, it's about getting the support for that family and moving on to another family and opening their networks again and so on and so on. So that building the capacity of the community, that's what's needed. So just, just go back to what you said near the beginning. I mean, so there's a really basic problem of legitimacy, isn't there? Mm. People don't want their neighbors to know. Mm. They think there's something that's disapproving of it. Then there's the whole point about taboo. I mean, this sounds, sounds like a very fundamental obstacle people are facing Yes. in that sense. And yet, if you give people some skills and some training, and they're complete strangers in this, this world, they can come in and provide support. Yes. Yes, it's almost they need the permission to do it. I think in, in our, you know, this day and age with all the privacy, confidentiality issues, people are not really... <clears throat> offering help, you know, although they, they know they can do it. But having a program like this one, uh, part of a community of practice, that's really, um, they like that. You know, they're not really operating um, single-handed. I mean, a lot of them have been helping in their own communities anyway. But it was good to have a group of them supporting each other, um, sounding each other off, you know, I did this thing for, the, for this family, maybe your family would benefit from that. So, so a model like this one really worked well. And just say, in Bunbury, where you've had this model, you've rolled it out, you've done a pilot, you've scaled it up. Say a little bit about how that builds cumulatively. You know, people come in and do a little bit, and then it leads to something else, leads to something else. Something about the actual pilot that you just, that you were in charge of. Um, so, so you mean the the model? Basically, we the connectors start looking at support from the community, and they're called caring helpers. Uh, some caring helpers would just want to do the one thing, you know, mow the lawn or fix the garden or something, and that's fine, you know. And the connector makes sure makes sure that you know this this link is happening, and the family has to be happy with that. So um, so on a uh, that can be rolled out at a much bigger scale because we've got communities everywhere uh, that are able to help. But the key issue is, do we have communities that are prepared to do this? Um, and and this is the prerequisite to rolling out a program like this is that how much education and training or preparation this community needs before we can have those people volunteering. Because again, it's not really easy to volunteer these days and you know the number of volunteers is shrinking. Um, and particularly because we still have a lot of traditional volunteering. Um, this has some, you know, it's a more sort of um, organic way, natural way of how people help each other. Um, so it's, um, it's great to, to start thinking that mode. And may I, may I just say something about how do you get the whole community to have this bigger vision? So what we've done in Bambri is develop a compassionate city charter so that everybody knows now what to do when someone is caring, dying, or grieving. Um, that's the only way, I mean, if, you know, as a program by itself, uh, it needed more, um, I suppose, for the whole community to know about it. And having a charter with basically, I uh, think, say, compassionate workplaces, 
do you know how to support your colleagues, you know, if somebody is is in this situation. Like I heard a story where this lady, you know, unfortunately lost, lost her um, a child and then after a period of mourning came back to, and she used to work in an open place uh, setting and uh, they pointed her to a closed office. They want to lock her away. I mean, lock her away in, in a nice way. Um, thinking that she needs privacy and all that stuff, but she wanted to be with them. She wanted to be supported. But what they're doing, they're protecting themselves from her pain. They didn't need to have to face that anymore if she was in office by herself. So again, Compassionate Workplaces is, a, is another forum that we will be conducting in Bambri. Compassionate schools, compassionate arts, galleries, like there are all sorts of ways we can do this. So it's about growing compassion in the community. And until, you know, and that's needed until we can have more people volunteering for that kind of work. R Rosalind, you want to be trained, you want to be um, one of these connectors have you shared that with your family and friends? Yeah. What, what have their re responses been? Husband's over there, so we can, we can ask him in a second. <laughs> so yeah, and, and they're all um, yeah, more than wanting me to get out there. I'm not quite there yet because I'm still feeling that I'm at the going to the grieving process, um, and I did do um, the day training and um, and I spoke to Samar about it. And Samar said to me, it "Will take up to three years to really feel to get through that grief." And I think with the program also. Um, it's not just when people die, it's also needing someone after. Um, and that's what I'm finding. I found this year, in all honesty, it would have been lovely to have had someone knock on your door. So I think um, in time, even to be trained to do that, I think I would even like to be doing that as part of the after as well. But um, yeah, we have, I have full support with one from the family. Even my dad, he, like I said, he's 88 and he always coming to nine. He goes, I'll come. You know, so, um, but because dad is very lonely and very much on his own now. And I know before mum passed, the house was busy. Silver chain, cleaners. When mum passed, nobody. And he's had a very lonely year. He's lucky he's had us. We're there all the time. But it is so important and that's why I want to do it. And yeah, I'll do it 110%. Thank you. That's very yeah. really interesting to know. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just looking at the clock. We're coming up to 25 past. Now's probably a good time to just to seg into um, some, some discussion with the audience as well. We've got a couple of mics lined up roving. Could you just sort of put your hand up, just catch my, my eye, and if you want to either make a comment or ask a question, maybe to an individual panel member, I see one lady there to start with. We can get one of these mics up there. And then you're going to share, you and I can share this one, yeah? Okay, so Miriam, just the lady there, first of all, Thank you. It's been a um, really enlightful conversation. Um, I was reflecting on how COVID was so hard for this situation, but maybe it's, there's some opportunities from COVID as well in the sense, and I, this is just me thinking out loud, um, I think COVID's given us a maturity in the sense of vulnerability um, in terms of... Um, uh, like mental health issues. So I think we're much more aware and more sophisticated than three years ago in that space. And so hopefully we can leverage off that as a key value of being honest and connected. That was a statement. Uh, the question is, I'd be interested in your opinions about that um, because I think it's... Um, yeah, we're not sophisticated. We, we don't have the language to talk about death at all. It's, it's terrible, like 70 years of not talking about it, 70 years of hiding from it, and guaranteed we're all going to be there. You know, this, it's, quite, it's quite a rich point if you start thinking about it. Who wants to comment? I guess I can comment. Um, I think the language around death is, is really hard for people to, to talk about, um, and actually... When I sit with families, I say, just start. You can't get it wrong. We'll be in a much richer place in 20 minutes and it doesn't matter if you get the words wrong. Um, so just start. Um, and I, I even teach, you know, when you're talking about advanced care planning as a doctor, if you start raising these really difficult questions, I'm now much, 
I think year by year I get more and more brutal in my opening statements. And actually I don't offend people and people don't get upset. And actually I say death and dying much earlier in my conversations than I would have pre-COVID. Um, and I think the point around mental health is really, really significant. I think I'm not sure we're sophisticated as a society in dealing with mental health yet, but we're at least brave enough to say it. Um, and I think if we at least be brave enough to say, is there a mental health component to this? Is there a psychological component to this? How is your psychosocial health? Um, I don't ask someone how their psychosocial health is. I ask them how their mood is. Um, and for a bloke, I always say, how's your morale? Because morale is a sporting term that blokes can relate to. And it's, you can't ask a bloke if they're depressed or not, but you can say, how's your morale? Um, so I, and I think we are beginning to get a bit more sophisticated in that, but I would challenge that getting the word right doesn't matter. Opening your mouth to speak is important. Okay. You know, certainly facing our mortality was a big thing during COVID, you know, young, old, it didn't discriminate. Um, and I guess um, there are advantages to this because again, people started talking about death, dying, and 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 grief support and bereavement support. And um, you know, although we've done our bereavement support research, you know, uh, quite a while, and it's you know, basically been taken up by so many countries to draw their own policies on bereavement support. Um, it didn't get that important until COVID, because there were a lot more people who were going through bereavement. Um, and then people noticed that we're going to do something about it now, and of course, affecting the mental well-being. Um, so it's got its positives in that sense, of course, a lot of negatives, but, uh, uh, but with the connectors, they didn't stop connecting with the families because, of course, there was the, you know, the uh, telephone, the email, the text, you know, all that stuff, uh, trying to see, you know, who they need and uh, advice. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, um, it's a very good point, Ashley. Mm. Can I, before we come to the next one, I'm just going to ask just um, a question that it cropped up earlier when we were chatting, because you mentioned blokes and morale. Um, I'm interested about jargon. You know, medics, doctors have their, their jargon. Um, the vocab d doubles on your way through med school, apparently. Just doubles, I was going to say trebled or something, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this, is, this might be part of, the first question I asked you was, what on earth is palliative? So this might be part and parcel of what we're talking about here, which is demystifying what at one level should be the blindingly obvious. There's nothing desperately mysterious about death in of itself. It goes alongside life. And yet there's so many you know, layers we're going through. Some of them are cultural, some of them emotional. And on top of that, we've got a bunch of people, let's call them professionals, who are um, fond of jargon. Absolutely. And um, I think that... I think it's a real challenge for many doctors and many health professionals to speak in the language that people understand um, and be prepared to adjust their language. And that whole point of, you know, I know more about you standing on the doorstep is very true. I know whether I should use football analogies or whether actually you're a learned professor and I need to watch my P's and Q's <laughs> and up my language. Um, but we need to be brave enough to do that and we need to watch for feedback um, because if I say something that the person in front of me doesn't understand, they generally won't tell me that unless I be quiet and wait. And I, I reflect on a patient I went to see about six times and every time, he was an elderly man, he lived in Kalamunda, and every time I went to see him, he had a newspaper and reading glasses. And I wrote him wonderful lists of the medications he should take, and he never took them, and I didn't get it. And I visited again and again and again, and the nurses told me he was illiterate after about six visits. And I said, well, why is he reading the newspaper? And it's to look good for the doctor. Okay, that's, that's quite powerful if you start thinking. Yeah? Um, any, anyone one else put, say anything about jargon? Anything confessional? <laughs> If your doctors speak to you in jargon, say, what do you mean? Okay. They won't be upset. Okay. And if they are, that's their problem, not yours. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Miriam, that lady was next, and then I'll come to you, okay? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your um, beautiful um, 
definition of palliative care. I wish I had have known that when my parents were passing. Um, I come from a very large family. I'm probably closer to my nieces and nephews than I am to, well, no, in age than to my um, elder senior brothers and sisters. And I know, I'm here tonight because I know I'm going to be the go-to person for them to help them with their parents. Um, and thank God we have a silver chain nurse as one of my nieces. Um, what advice would you give us to build that community and break down those, break that circle and um, help the family cope? Um, you're, you're giving great advice about um, how to speak to people with palliative care and I guess some of that does apply to the broader family as well. But how do we um, lead the family through this sort of situation? Advanced care planning. That would be one way to start those conversations because it's not just about what treatment do they want or they don't want. It's about their values, who they, who they want around them, you know, when they reach that stage, uh, what legacy they want to leave behind, uh, what kind of funeral do they want, you know, or they don't want. Um, so these kind of things will start, you know, opening up those taboo subjects. It's not easy to, to you know, if you've never had a conversation about that. But um, uh, you can start by saying, look, you're great now, you know, you are in, a good, in good health. What are the things that are most important to you and you want to hold on to in terms of uh, um, you want to travel, you, you want to, you know, um, um, have your grandkids around you all the time, you know, that kind of thing. Now, if in a few years' time you won't feel well enough, how would your values change? What is it that you really want to hold on to most? Um, so, so then they start thinking, right? It's like a slow process, but it's nice to have those conversations and get them to think. It, it's not easy to, when you ask people, what are your values? Um, nobody thinks about this stuff or talk about it really. But with those sort of gentle conversations about, you know, and, and maybe, um, you know, with Palliative Care Australia on their website, you, you would have those sort of list of values. Um, and it would be, it's a good conversation starter in terms of uh, what matters to you most now? What would matter to you most if you became ill and you, and you were disabled and you couldn't do the stuff that you wanted to do? So, so I'm, I'm bound to ask Rosalind on that question. It's so, if someone had come to you or your late mum and said advanced care planning, what, what would have been the reaction? Um, well, for mum, it was her brain. So we actually had to do a lot of the talking for her in, in the end. Um, but yes. Yeah, we would have, you know, we, we didn't have anyone to have that discussion with, um, but we would have definitely, I, I mean, as a family, we just had that discussion. Um, in talking about doctors, going back to that, our doctor, um, mum's oncologist, he was amazing. He didn't have, he had our jargon. He sat down with dad and he said, Jesse, it's time to prepare Lena for end of life. And he was an amazing man. And dad talked to him for 20 minutes and he was amazing. Um, yeah, we had others who, didn't want to speak that way. So a lot of it, I think it's person, personal, or p p people's personalities in a lot of the way as well. Um, but um, for us, yeah, we didn't have that conversation. We just had the conversation ourselves. And we never had that chance with mum being a brain cancer. So we couldn't have that chance. Okay. All right, thank you. Do you want to add one more? And, and the conversation is harder because um, our parents, grandparents have never had any conversation to do with death and dying when they were younger. I think the younger generation would be much more better prepared because they've, they've been part of this, hopefully. This is what we're trying to change with the Compassionate Communities Movement. Um, so it is a difficult conversation and probably it's better not to call it that, to start off advanced care planning. It's about let's discuss what matters most to you in life. And from there, you know, things will move on. Okay, yeah. right. You've been very patient. Lady in blue. Good night. Thank you very much. I have a question. It's something that in this moment I am living. So I just ask uh, how uh, we can face uh, the stubbornness of a terminal cancer friend who is a struggle with a SEP that need help and is a struggle as well to accept that admit that he 
she's in a vulnerable moment in life. And I have more context about this because this friend of me suffered from or was has been diagnostic of anxiety, depression, and narcissistic personality disorder. All that? Anxiety, depression, and narcissistic personality disorder. But, but it, it's not an uncommon problem where people, to use an expression, are in denial, okay? You know, it's maybe, maybe it's an instinctive thing. Who would like to comment? Um, I guess it's an incredibly challenging situation. Um, and I can't comment on specifics, but I guess the most important thing is to be there because at some point the denial will start to break down. So, um, and be there always, um, you know, and and hope that you do get a window. Um, get appropriate support. It sounds like a mental health nurse and an ongoing relationship with somebody in a mental health profession would be useful. Um, and I think the consistency of informal support being there as well as formal support being there is probably the most useful. And some of the personality disorders, I'm not a psychiatrist, but some of the personality disorders are the most challenging because our outward demonstration of behaviour can push people away when we're actually not wanting that. So, um, and social norms go out the window. So what we need is deep love from health professionals and our friends and family. But, um, yeah. Um, so this person has got family like uh, around them or friends or uh, mm. yeah yes so so again it's about you know having communities well prepared to to care for somebody you know in this situation um, because you know Whatever, whatever problems were in life usually are carried on, you know, in the, in the death stage as well, all the dynamics, you know. So it's not something that only happened during the, the death stage of, you know, your friend, is that a friend? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, it's, so the people who are there to support you during your, your life are the best ones to support you during your death because they know about all these problems that you have faced during your life. Um, it's it's at that stage is probably quite difficult with a complicated situation like this to bring someone new into the equation if they haven't been part of your life. So that's why look at your networks, who's around you, who's going to be around now and you know at the time um, of death and beyond to support your family, so so that you don't feel you know so. I guess, um, in such a situation when you just don't know what to do at this stage anymore. Yeah. But certainly, um, for personality disorder, I agree with Fiona, you probably need a bit more professional support. And yeah. it's very hard. Issues around denial and consent, um, and consent for medical treatment are incredibly complicated. Yeah. Um, because clearly, I can't see anybody unless they consent to me being involved in their care, which is entirely appropriate, but that can get lost sometimes in complex psycho psychiatric situations. Exactly. Okay. Um, I don't have a great deal of useful advice, but perhaps one of the most useful things would be to ask permission to share. So if if you were able to work at getting her permission for you to share that information with doctors, nurses, those involved in her care, that would be useful. Um, and even and then some of the consent issues improve, you know? So certainly for us, if we have a patient's consent to share their health information with somebody else, it gets easier. So perhaps that would be one way forward seeking her permission to share. But yeah, I can talk to you afterwards if you like. Go ahead, yeah, can we get the microphone? Oh, the people won't hear otherwise. Just give a second, yeah? Yeah. 
So my mother died in a palliative care unit in Bethesda Hospital in Claremont. She had double cancer, ovarian and cervical. She was having oncology treatment in King Edward Hospital. I was against that, but other siblings were in favor of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure whether it was a cancer that killed her or whether it was the um, natural death, if you like, I don't know. She was being given the um, painkiller treatment, self-managed painkiller. When she was in the Bethesda Hospital, she was being looked after, but she had to manage her own pain-killing, um, you know, the, the, the device that they give you, they give mm. to the patient, so that they can inject the, um, I don't know what it's called, you know. And I just can't get my head around the fact that whether it was just too much for her, whether she was taking the um, painkiller medication with the doctor's approval. There were doctors around, nurses around, but they had the situation in such a way that we couldn't tell whether the mother was being uh, looked after by them for all her problems because she was in pain. So they were giving her the pain-killing medication because of her pain, to relieve her pain. There's very little research in that area, I noticed that. This is about seven, eight years back. So like Summer mentioned in the beginning, that's a social thing when a person is dying. So family members were there. Myself, all my siblings, other family members, grandchildren, everyone was there. But she could not speak, she could not do anything, she could not say anything. I don't even know whether she was aware that we were there around her, you know. So I, I just uh, want to know that is that a very common thing that when a person dying or from cancer, like for example, double cancer, in a lot of pain, is being just given a lot of morphine, if you like, or a lot of painkillers, very heavy painkillers, and we don't know whether they are going to come out of that uh, vegetative state or not. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I just like some more information, if you like. I guess I can talk generally. I can't talk about her specific care because um, I don't know the drugs and doses and all those things. Um, but I guess a decreased level of consciousness and less responsiveness at the end of life is a normal and natural part of dying. So people often think the doctor started a morphine pump and she died. Actually, losing the ability to swallow and therefore medications being given by injection to ensure that they are still given um, is a normal and natural part of dying. It is actually really hard to to overdose on painkillers at the end of life if you have been on painkillers for a period of time. And there is some evidence that in normal doses, there are extreme situations which are different, but in normal doses, good pain control, good symptom control at the end of life actually may extend someone's life, not shorten it. Um, so I think it's really important that I think what was happening, reading between the lines, is that she was dying almost certainly from the cancer itself. And as part of that natural dying was losing the ability to communicate. What we also know from people who have been very sick and recovered um, and also from all sorts of fancy brain scans during the dying process is that familiar loved ones' voices are nearly always heard on some level um, and familiar music is nearly always heard on some level. Um, and I guess that's, that's part of the connection of life. And I always say to patients, I always introduce myself to patients when they're minutes from death. And I always talk to patients because I believe they can hear me. Um, does that answer some of your question? Thanks. But very little research is done in that area. I know that much. There is, there is, no, there is, some research, um, uh, Michael Barbato's work talks about um, awareness at the end of life, um, and we know we know what opioid overdose dying looks like, and that actually looks very different to natural dying. So, yeah. Thank you. I guess, <clears throat> Ahmed, this is the kind of information that should have been explained to you. 
what are the processes of dying? At what stage is your mother in, in now? And again, when we do those um, surveys, um, that has come up quite a lot. So we've had this uh, wife who's been knitting for half a day uh, in her husband's room, <coughs> thinking he was sleeping. After five hours, the nurse walks in and she said, he's dead. He's been dead for a while, you know. Mm. Well, how come nobody told me he was so quite near it, you know, like, how would I look for signs? So that's again all about that death literacy that we want the community to actually arm themselves and ask the right questions. You know, maybe if you were there and uh, you asked the nurse, like, tell me at what stage of dying, you know, my mother is or what, what signs should I look for, for to, you know instead of really wanting to understand the morphine, you know, and all that stuff, it's all that process that we need to be really literate in. Um, and that way we're not surprised and death doesn't take us by surprise. A lot of people are like, I didn't know she was going to die so soon, you know, like, yeah, did you want something? Just else? really briefly, I've got one more question to get in. I just wanted to plug Palliative Care Australia's booklet entitled Palliative Caring which talks about the stages of normal dying. It would be a good starting point. It talks about how to care for someone um, and it, yeah, it does talk about normal dying. Thank you. You've been very patient. Off you go. Thank you so very much for this very informative presentation. Uh, and I just want to say I have my utmost uh, admiration and gratitude for Silver Chain in our life. Uh, about six months ago, I became the primary care of an 88-year-old woman. And it's been one of the most uh, rewarding experiences of my life. I had no idea how rewarding it could be. A week ago today, uh, I came upon her, and she had suffered a massive stroke. And I was very good doing what I needed to do with Triple O and getting the ambulance. We were south of Margaret River. They took her to Bunbury. Then when I spoke with the doctor in Bunbury, he quizzed me at length about Monica's well-being generally, her general state of health and mood, mm. and it seemed very strange. And he said he wasn't sure what they were, the next move was going to be. And then about 30 minutes later, he called and he said, because you said the things that you said, we have made a decision to send her on the Royal Flying Doctors to Perth for brain surgery instead of palliate her. And I had never heard of that verb before. I was completely bewildered by it. And I had images of them just packing her full of morphine. So my question has to do with First, what on earth does that word palliate mean when a doctor says it in the emergency room? And It means they're afraid to tell you what's going on and then afraid to say death. Right, right. Sorry, I would that's like blunt. I would like to say that I saw my friend yesterday and she's making a remarkable recovery after three and a half hours of brain surgery. This is a very challenging thing to do to be with people at the end of their life to live fully. And um, right now I'm trying to figure out ways of talking with the people in the nurses staff to find out things even though I'm not the next of kin. So yes, you're absolutely correct. These are very challenging things to do. Thank you. I think the verb to palliate requires further explanation always. Um, and I think what the doctor was trying to say was Without brain surgery, she may well die. Um, and I think that is probably reading between the lines what was meant, um, but I don't know that. But I don't know what to palliate means, even though I'm a palliative care doctor, if that helps. Okay, can I just ask one thing on top of that? I mean, um, in within the medical community yourself, do you see um, next generation training awareness getting better, being the same? What's your sort of general observation? So that we don't end up with a situation where people use that verb indiscriminately in terms of how, what people then hear. I think I'm genuinely excited sometimes when I talk to med students. Our current crop of med students, I don't know what you think, Samar, you speak to them, you know, a lot. I think um, 
young people and current med students have a much broader world view than I did. I mean, I decided I wanted to be a doctor when I was eight years old and I didn't question it. Now, that's actually not a sensible way to become a doctor. Um, but I think we have a much more diverse group of medical students from a much more diverse range of backgrounds with different experience, and a lot of them are older, um, which I think, and have different life experience. So I am hopeful, but the medical system and hospitals and institutions are not necessarily nice, supportive, or encouraging of new ideas. And the conversation we have had tonight, particularly around, you know, the clinical care is only 5% of what's important, is really challenging to doctors. And I think that we need to keep telling that to med students and they need to see it lived because actually it is Samar's work and even broader than that, it's the whole community that need to train our med students. Okay, so that brings us, you, you can comment about that, but I also want to sort of smuggle in one larger point. Um, you're lucky enough or we're lucky enough to have you as the West Australian of the Year. You've obviously got a platform, we have a platform. Um, what, what, what's your, you know, briefly share with, with the audience, what, what's your real hopes about getting things done and communicated and appreciated this year through that platform? It's for the community to know that they are equal partner in delivering palliative care. You know, do not underestimate your, what you can do and do not overestimate what professionals can do in this field. I'm not saying in all fields, obviously. Uh, and when I talk to medical students, they get it. They know that, you know, they're not the answer to everything. They will never be, and particularly in the palliative care field. And uh, I've only presented to a group last week, and they said, that's really refreshing, because the first thing we're going to ask now our patients is, where are your social networks? Who's there to support you? How, you know, and again, encourage that death literacy uh, to be present, even health literacy to, to start off with. So. Um, Personally, I feel, um, you know, the way we've had a campaign for advanced care planning, and probably it was a, a bit too soon if the, if the community is not well prepared in those things. So to go straight into a discussion like this is not easy. Uh, we need the community to know um, how to care for someone who's caring for someone with life-limiting illness, who's dying from it, and who's grieving from it. Uh, and that comes through education and uh, you know public awareness. And I guess that's what I'd like to see happening this year, not even at the national level, but we could start with the state level for now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to, oh, there's, uh, be gone, I've got two hands. Keep them really, really she's brief. Had it, she's had her hand. You first, while, okay? Joanne, right. yeah. We don't mind going over just a few minutes. Just keep it really brief. Very brief. Thank you. It's been really informative. I sat in this venue a while ago for a death and dying day that was also very um, uh, valuable. And I'm quite sure I heard mention of the fact that Silver Chain have a policy that no one dies alone and that there is some sort of training for death jewellers. I wonder if anyone could add information about that because whilst I really understand the role of connectors and think it's incredibly valuable, actually being able to prepare yourself for being there at that end of life as a community member would also be really useful. And I just wonder if anyone could comment on training or resources in that area, please. Be ended briefly. So Silver Chain don't have a formal training process. Um, people very seldom die alone, um, but we don't have a formal training process. Some of the larger nursing home groups do, um, and it's escaped me. Which one does now? Okay, fine. Um, is it Bethany? Someone trying to yeah, do this? We'll, we'll figure it. Gordon, you got, get the microphone here just really briefly. Sorry. And then we will wind up. Uh, concerning palliative care, I unfortunately experienced that, not personally, though I don't mind. I'm almost at the stage where I'm quite happy to go to the next world. But three years ago, my poor wife, unfortunately, we had separated 21 years ago, but we kept in touch. And three years ago, she was not well. And in, I wasn't aware that in Albany, she passed away. She went for one week in hospital. And in fact, it was amazing. She actually she called in the priest and organized everything to do with her funeral. That was quite amazing. Um, 
so I've experienced a palliative uh, situation. My concern is that we, our society seems to be not coming together but separating. Uh, how can we, how can we, if someone is not well, how can we share and help each other when in fact we are diverging? I'm going to treat that as more as a comment. Okay, I don't think. Um, I can, can say you, something you know, here. Really yeah, briefly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is what I mean. We've got to have compassionate communities everywhere. The, you know, the, the, the communities need to get together, and that's part of the talks that I'm giving to local governments. So your local government, you know, that's a community in a way that you can work together with whoever is there um, to create that compassionate community. Then you all know each other. You can all support each other. So we need to start, you know, getting those nucleus happening everywhere. And if I may just say, look, in the next 25 years, the number of people who are going to die will double. We can't have a palliative care service in every suburb. That's not going to happen. It's too costly, and we don't need it to that extent if the community takes their role and get really educated in how they can help each other. OK, um, we're going to have to sort of end it there. Um, look, thanks. I've just got a couple of sort of tasks in terms of thank yous. Um, uh, in, in no particular order. First of all, uh, very um, grateful for our collaboration both with the Perrin Institute but also with the State Library of Western Australia and Rita Alfred Sagar's work in making this event such a success behind the scenes. Uh, but also the very considerable work they've also been doing in terms of previously showcasing um, uh, you know, different, um, different initiatives in this field. So thank you very much for that. Enormously indebted to the panel. Um, Samar, Rosalind, and Fiona. Um, uh, Rosalind more so, because I'm not sure she's doing this on a daily basis. The, you two are often doing this. So um, it's, um, it's no easy thing. I think, I think the audience the audience has got a great deal out of uh, uh, your sort of experience in sharing that. Um, can I also, whilst I'm at it, sort of uh, thank the staff who seamlessly at the Policy Institute who do all the real hard work. Uh, Miriam over there, Chris over there, Claire over there. So thank you very much. And interns who I, I can't see, but they also do a lot of the heavy lifting. I'm sometimes accused of ending uh, these sessions as a salesman, so let me do that. Let me plug the Institute's next report. I'm waving it around nowadays. It's on a pretty much unrelated subject. You may be able to read the cover from here. Uh, we spend the best part of half a year producing an august report about some important aspect of public policy. Our report, which is hot off the press but launched next month, is entitled Indian Ocean Futures, Prospect for Shared Regional Success. So please go off and sort of, you know, buy your copy now. No, you don't need to. They're free. Um, but I just want to make sure that you're aware of the range of things we do um, beyond the, the event that we've been involved in this evening. Um, and the very last thing I have to say is wish you a very pleasant evening and a safe journey home. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.